Hi guys, it's Barnaby for Spurred On, and I am here for a new strand we've got called My Time at Tottenham, and our first guest is the one and only Rowan Ricketts. Rowan, how are you, mate? What's going on, my brother? Ex-Spurs player, absolutely it. legendary. Back when I was about 21, 22, Rowan was playing for the team and ripping it up. And uh, now, tell us a little bit about what you're up to now, Rowan. Um, well, since 2008, I've been playing outside of the country. I left Barnsley and went to go and play in the MLS for Toronto FC. Had an amazing time there, got to meet my other half. Now we have a little one, been together seven years, so that's been amazing. And then I went on and played in Hungary, Moldova, Germany, Thailand, yeah. India, Hong Kong, and even South America, Ecuador, well, and Spanish. But I've been on a world tour, as you said. Yeah, amazing. I've read some articles with you uh, about you being the most well-traveled player still playing at the moment. And you were telling me that you've, you know, you've learned, like you said, you learned Spanish, and it's really given you a, a better outlook on life. You're really glad you've done it. Yeah, it's just opening my eyes up to um, a lot of things, you know, because when you're playing the Premier League, obviously I started at Arsenal, then I went to Spurs, and you kind of like, it's kind of like a, it's 5% of what's really going on out there in football, and it's the, it's the elite. Um, everything's basically done for you, you earn lots of money, and it was amazing. Um, but then after, since I've left the country, I've got to learn more about different cultures. I'm, yeah. I'm one of these people, I'm more than just a football player. And some people are just cool to live in that bubble. Sure. Um, would I have liked to continue playing for Spurs and gone on to play for England? Yes, I would have. But I've been fortunate enough to see the world, sustain, have a nice sustainable career, learn another language, got some amazing friends in different parts of the world. So it's an adventure. Would I change it if I could do it again? I don't know, probably not, because I've done some amazing things. Yeah, and, and football's just such a short career, isn't it? So you're, you're readying yourself better than a lot of footballers will be uh, for your time after, after you finish playing. Yeah, for the last five years, I've been doing a lot of media work. Um, I got an opportunity in Toronto, actually. Um, I was on um, the um, an, an analysis group for the um, <coughs> one of the World Cups. Great. Um, that was radio and on air, the under 21s, done a lot of radio stuff um, since I've been back in England. So I've been doing a lot of stuff which is prepping me for my future. Sure. And also I've been creating a lot of content and coming up with different formats and concepts for TV shows or shows that can be seen online. So yeah, yeah I'm coming for coming for the new space, the online space. Brilliant. So uh, let's get back to the most important thing, of course, and that's your time at Spurs. Now, you're very f one of the very few people to have crossed the divide, the, the hated North London divide. Only four players have done that. You are one of them. Tell us how that came about, moving from Arsenal, where you were in their academy, and moving over to Spurs. Well, I was a young player. I went to Arsenal. I was 10 years old, got picked up by Arsenal. Uh, played for the club um, up every level, up to first team level. I played for, made my debut at 18 against Manchester United. Uh, played in the reserves by the time I was 16, was training them with the yeah. first team by the time I was 16, 17. Won back-to-back -back youth cups, known as one of the best generations, if not the best, to come out of the club. Mm -hmm. Great, but then at the time, it was difficult to get an opportunity. I was competing with the one and only PV, Patrick Vieira. Right. First of all, I was cleaning... He was an alright player for yeah, them. He was, was alright. It was average. <laughs> for, first of all, I'm cleaning the man's boots. <laughs> so I'm cleaning these boots as, as, as a YTS player, and then you're having to compete Arsenal Wenger was a big fan of me, but Arsenal at that time was one of the best clubs, teams in the world. Yeah. They've always been a big club, like Spurs are a big club, but yeah. they was really like Champions yeah. League final yeah. and all that stuff. So it was difficult. Um, one day at a reserve game, a guy comes over to, to watch my game with my agent at the time was Rob Siegel. And his friend comes over and they see me play in the Arsenal reserve game and they say, hey, look, would you like to play for Spurs? And I was like, yeah, he said, uh, you could play for Spurs as Spurs team now. What was he, a scout of Spurs, a Spurs scout? Or a well, his name's Brad Warner. I put his name out there. He's an agent now, actually. When he met me, he was just a friend of an agent. Right. Um, so Brad Warner came over. He was friends with someone at Spurs in the, uh, in the higher echelons of the club. And he said, look, um, I think you can play for Spurs now. He said, I put my mortgage on it. And I was yeah. like, oh, cool, thanks. And then we uh, met a few people. On the sly. On the sly. Yeah. On, the, on the DL, as yeah. we like to say. Yeah, yeah. From the other side. Yeah. And had a few conversations, and then there was a big interest, and then we made it happen. And it was something for me that was like, it's work, right? Yeah. I wasn't getting an opportunity at a club, yeah. and I saw that it wasn't going to come anytime soon. You thought you had a much better chance of playing first team football, which of course you, you then ended yeah. up Yeah, and then I got to play with the one, um, get to be coached by the one and only. Well, that brings me on to my next question. Obviously, Glenn Hoddle was a huge fan of yours, he was manager there when you were there. You know, what was your relationship like with him? What was he like as a coach? I mean, I think, you know, just say, obviously, huge club legend as a player at Spurs. And then as a coach, I feel like he got a bit of a raw deal. He didn't have a good, he didn't, the results weren't quite there, but he was bombed out pretty soon after, um, 
uh, not, you know, maybe he wasn't given enough time, but, but you were saying to me that he, he was excellent to you, wasn't he? Uh, unbelievable to me as a person. And as a coach, like, I understood him. Do you know what I mean, I'm not one of these people who judge people on one comment. So sometimes you can think Glenn's public perception killed him. Right. So I mean, people say, oh, he's strange, he's weird. He had these, um, you could say, views that were different from everyone sure, else sure. with his religious beliefs. Yeah. But you know I mean, everyone has a re Glenn, what I would say to him personally now, as I'm probably old enough to have that conversation, is he was too honest. Right. Do you know what I mean? Honesty is a great thing, but he was too honest and then they... You mean like, like honest, honest in terms of his uh, views? Big, but with the press and the media rather yeah, than... Yeah, way uh, too honest. Yeah. And it's sad because you, you would think that someone could be honest without getting ridiculed, mm. but people are in it to sell new newspapers, uh, controversies selling the newspapers, sure. right? Anyway, but for me, Glenn looked after me from the day I stepped into the club. He said to me, you're a rough diamond. I want to give you a chance because you've got a rare talent. He, he kind of looked after me. He put his arm around me. John Gorman as well, Chris yeah. Hewton, yeah. Who, who were his assistants. But amazing person. Glenn was a bit before his time in a sense, and maybe he needed to be at a bigger club because he, his way that he wanted to There play. aren't any bigger clubs, but oh, I know right. what you mean. Higher yeah. up the league at I the love time. It, I we love weren't it. doing very well at the time, so I know what you yeah. mean. Yeah, so he, he basically wanted to play football in the right way. I mean, in the way where it was um, aesthetically pleasing on the yeah. eye, passing and moving, passing through the lines. What people say about Brendan Rodgers and like, Glenn was doing that a long, long time ago. Because um, the results in the goal, he's been sacked, and sometimes maybe you haven't seen the best of his sure. work. Yeah. But unbelievable. Sometimes can be very... Well, too harsh and critical because he was such a good player. Like, yeah. Let me tell you something. The Spurs fans that are probably watching this, the young ones, you probably didn't get to see Glenn play. The older ones, you got to see him play yourself, you got to see glimpses of him. This guy used to train with us, right? Yeah. Glenn used to train with us at Spurs, also at Wolves. And it's, he used to do things, and you think, like, what? Like, so, like, he used to do things with the ball with both feet. Yeah. Both feet, like... Outside, and he was like 50 years old. He was about 50 as well. years old, yeah. and he's just gliding through and just like, oh my god, what am I doing yeah. here? I was a quick. This guy, uh, your coach is better than you, your manager. It's over. But do you think? For, I mean, it's amazing that you speak really well of that. But do you think to some players, maybe that um, affected their ego slightly? Definitely, definitely. There, there's been times where he's been challenging to me. I give you a little quick exclusive. Um, he, he, I remember one time he was taking free kicks. And I'm not renowned as a free kick specialist, but I was taking him because he, he thought with my technique I should be taking free kicks. Sure. Uh, we're taking free kicks, and Glenn comes up to me and he says, look, if you can't do this, I don't know what you're doing playing football. He said that to me. I just looked at him. And how did that make you feel, yeah? Me, I'm just thinking, okay, he believes in me so much, but I didn't take it like that because I know, I know what he meant, but there are people that I'm thinking, oh, who's this? He thinks he's too arrogant, he's yeah. this. Then yeah. it's like... No, he probably believes in you so much, and he probably pushed himself. Like this, sometimes you've got to look at things in a different perspective, and he probably pushed himself. Like, maybe I should have pushed myself, sure. dedicated more time to be a specialist like he was. But I remember he said that to me, and I was like, wow, yeah. geez. And then he presumably proved that he could do it, so you should be doing it yeah. as well. Yeah, and then I just walked off and went in. <laughs> and then walked off, <laughs> and the training for you. So then Glenn left, as we've discussed, and we, you were still at the club when uh, Santini and Yol came in? Yep. Uh, so obviously Santini wasn't there for very long at all, but Martin was uh, Martin Yol was there a bit longer. How did their styles differ to uh, to Glenn's as a manager? Uh, oh, let's suppose it. Jack Santini, night and day to Glenn, madness. He just, the guy came in. Um, I understand sometimes you don't speak the language, so he didn't speak any English. Right. He was super, super defensive. He had like, pussy. Michael Carrick. It was parking the bus time, wasn't it? We drew it's nil nil against Chelsea, and buses. Mourinho called us that said that we parked the bus. Yeah, buses, plural. He had buses all the way through the pitch. <laughs> he had my, he had what's his name? Michael Carrick was in reserves with me. Um, we had. Um, God. I know exactly. Carrick was one of the great players at Spurs. He had Sean he Davis, who's a mate, who's a good footballer. He was a good player. Sean he was Davis good, good footballer. Fulham, yeah. yeah, real good footballer. But he was more defensive. He had him in there. He had Michael Brown in there. He had a right back. He had a right back, a right wing, a left back, a left wing. It was just so defensive. I had no chance, do you know what I mean? So I went out on loan at that time to Coventry. But that was crazy. Martin Yo comes... Martin Yo was his assistant. Yeah, I remember. But I always knew that. I used to speak to Martin and I said, Martin, look at you. You're just hanging in the wind because you know this bus yeah, is cause he'd to come, he'd, Yeah, he'd come from being a manager in uh, Holland mm -hmm. where he'd done well. He came to be Santini's assistant and it did always feel like he probably knew that, that it wasn't going to work out. Yeah, he, he was probably sitting there in the back <laughs> and <laughs> chopping away. And Martin, no, Martin was a great man. He's another one. I had a close relationship with him. He was very personal. Um, lovely coach. Very smart. Um, he believed in me a lot as well. He gave me opportunities to play. And I remember I got a little injury. 
And I remember there's a game, I don't know if you remember, I played against uh, Man City away. Right. And I went on this run, it was an amazing run. Skipped in between two, went past Danny Mills, David James and goal, and I should have scored it, but probably would have been the best goal that I scored. Yeah. And I remember after the game, I said, you got to finish that. You got to finish. I'm giving you an opportunity. You got to finish that. You're gonna, <laughs> you finish that, you're a star. In his strange Dutch American yeah, accent that you've yeah, just done an impression of there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. But that, he was a good guy. Sorry, yeah. Martin, but I'm trying to be. <laughs> He got, he got treated badly by Spurs as well because he he I think was the kind of conduit to what Spurs are now pushing top four every every year. He was the first person to really get us into that kind of fifth, situation. Right? Didn't he finish fifth? Back he back? finished fifth. We uh, had, if you remember we had to go to West Ham and win on the last day. It was Arsenal's last game ever at Highbury and uh, we got ill. Lasagna Gate. Do you remember that was all mm. under Martin Young. But that was the first season where we were pushing top four and I really think that he was the manager and a lot of Spurs fans will agree he was the manager that really pushed us towards that level that we play at these days. Yeah, 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 he came in, he, he's similar to Glenn as well, like, he comes from Holland, yeah. um, Ajax and he, that same philosophy where they're playing sometimes 4-3-3, three, three, passing through the lines, possession based football, yeah. and what, 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 like for me, what a coach, I mean, and sometimes, and Spurs, so, I mean, I think sometimes managers go to Spurs, they kind of, um, how do I say, they suffer from the history of the clubs, yeah, the expectations, expectations yeah. are just up there, and it's like, I was speaking to someone the other day, and it was like, they want top four or top three, and I was like, oh, well, like if you look at Spurs' squad that they have, if they finish top five, even top six with the youngsters, the, the, the new sure. bread, breed of youngsters, should be happy with that. Yeah. I mean, push on. Um, and Martin suffered from that. Um, but yeah. What a guy. No, he did a great job. And um, just before we end part one, because we can do two parts of this video. Um, you mentioned to me a bit before that uh, at the time David Pleat was director of football, and things didn't always go swimmingly in terms of the politics at the club. Can you give us an example of how those politics affected you and or other players? Wow, politics. David Pleat. <laughs> wow. You know what's funny? Because sometimes I try to um, how maybe try to look at things from a different perspective. Sure. Um, at, when I was younger, your emotions are involved and you're like, oh, I hate this guy. Do you know what I mean? Because yeah. you're blocking my path. I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm talented. The coaches are saying that. The players themselves are saying that. And then you've got one guy saying, no, I think you should, um, uh, Rowan Ricketts, um, I think you should look at Belgium. I'm going to look at Belgium for you because, um, <laughs> you know, just maybe the physicalities of England, technically you're fantastic, but, and I was like... So he was thinking of sending you out on loan to Belgium, yeah. At the, at the point where I'm on the edge of the first team and Glenn Hoddle, who's the manager, who's making the, the managerial decisions and technical decisions of who plays, he's telling me, you're going to play for the club. Yeah. I'm going to give you an opportunity. So then I'm having two meetings in the space of 45 minutes with two different areas of the club telling me two different things. Yeah. Like, that shouldn't be happening. Everyone's meant to be pulling in the same direction. Sure. But it wasn't no fault to Glenn because Glenn, the players, all fought the same. Then David was on the other end thinking something completely different. I played under again, played one London again, won awards under again, and when I say awards, I mean like back to back young yeah, Premier League player of the month, and stuff, stuff yeah. like that. I won Young Player of the Year, but David now was singing the whole, I was in England on 21s, and then you got David Pleat, who was just pulling in a whole different direction. I don't know if it was because he bought me, no, they got me for nothing, and he spent money on Jonathan Blondell. That's, That's right, what another, I another young player at the time we'd spent a million quid on, and, uh, had and to just David Pleat had spent that money, hadn't he? Yeah, I think players like um, Anthony Gardner, a million pound from Port Vale. Simon Davis, Matthew Edmonton. Peter Bray, yeah. These were guys that um, David had bought with the sure. budget maybe Daniel had given him for the young players. And like a lot of people said that was the reason because it was like I was playing well, training hard, behaving myself, and just David just wasn't doing it. So David, I always wanted to know why. Well, to some degree, what it sounds like is that Pleat had some insecurity over his own job and how good a job he was doing. So he's trying to push and force feed Glenn the players that he's bought for that amount of money. That's Whereas Glenn, as he, as he said, saw you as a rough diamond who he wanted to mentor up and, and, and do well yourself. And you'd started doing that before David Pleat's signings had started doing well. Yeah. So that's what it kind of seems like to me. Yeah, it, it seems, I don't know. I, I politics, try, politics. Yeah, it's, it's politics, I call it. Politics. Yeah, it's yeah. like, it was crazy. But um, it, like, and like I said to you, back then I had such a bad feeling about David. Um, but as I got older, I tried to be more understanding. Maybe I just was his style of player. But sure. it was like crazy because he used to speak to my agent or other agents and s like praise me highly in training. Ron Ricketts is world classed, um, but he doesn't tackle and he doesn't shoot. But there's many players around the world in foreign countries that don't. But I think because we're playing in England, 
I suffered because of the, um, how important is it? I was a certain type of player. I'm not a natural goal scorer. Sure. I'm not a tackler. But then you look at someone like, say, for example, Iniesta coming through, or there's many players like that in Barcelona create, whereas they all create chances. Yeah. I create loads of chances for Spurs, but David had this opinion, and it just really... Yeah, picking was, holes. Picking yeah, holes it was horrible. Yeah. I remember he used to say to me, I saw you play yesterday. You decorated the pitch, you decorated it, but you didn't have much shots. I said, David, David, yeah. leave me alone. You, you, needed more of a, you needed more of an arm around the shoulder that Glenn was giving you rather than that kind of tough love that yeah, David Pleasant was giving you. I don't get it. I really don't get it. But, um, but anyway. Such is life. No hard feelings, David. No, it's good. Great. To, it's a brilliant insight to be able to hear about that kind of politics. Um, guys, that's the end of part one of this video. We're going to do another part where I'm going to ask uh, Rowan a few more kind of quick fire questions. Uh, so uh, let us know what you think in the comment section below. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel on YouTube and follow us on Twitter at Spurred on TV. Come on, you Spurs. Hi guys, Barnaby for Spurred On. Welcome to part two of the video, my time at Tottenham with our first guest, Rowan Ricketts. Rowan has been incredibly insightful in the first part, so make sure you do check that out.